Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this morning um, <clears throat> about what you see here. And we use, uh, this is a, actually a long-term collaboration I've had with people at Washington University in St. Louis using positron emission tomography to image estrogen receptor levels and estrogen receptor function uh, with the specific purpose of better selecting patients who will benefit from endocrine therapies. Now I think you all know that estrogens are female reproductive hormones. They also have effects in men. And they affect many t tissue systems and organ systems outside of the reproductive system, tissues. But the mammary gland is the one we'll focus on today because uh, estrogen uh, promotes mammary gland development and also drives a certain fraction of breast cancers. Now, the estrogen receptor is a transcription factor. Ligand binds to it and it binds to specific DNA sites and alters patterns of gene regulation. So as a target for imaging, it is a intracellular, actually intranuclear target. So anything that would uh, detect it by labeling a small molecule would have to penetrate the cell. Now, in terms of the role estrogens play in breast cancer, I mentioned that it's a, a driver of proliferation. And this was actually recognized uh, indirectly more than a century ago that 30% of breast cancer patients would benefit from some form of endocrine therapy. At the time, it was actually removing a woman's ovaries. And a very alert Scottish physician recognized this. And this really can be considered the first form of targeted therapy way back then. Now that ovaryectomy has been replaced by uh, endocrine therapies that are anti-estrogens or aromatase inhibitors. And if it works, it spares the cancer patient the morbidity associated with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. But only a third of patients respond. So the question is, how do you identify those patients? And when the estrogen receptor was first characterized in the late 60s, they figured that was the answer. If you have receptor, you'll respond to endocrine therapies. If you don't, you won't respond. Now it turned out that half of those statements are true. Because if you look at uh, estrogen receptor levels by immunohistochemistry assays, which is what's done now typically, only a third of them lack receptor. And this negative test is actually very predictive of a lack of response. Two thirds have receptor, but only half of them respond, and so the other half don't. So the estrogen receptor assay is typically done, has strong negative predictive value, but poor positive predictive value. And we speculated that if we could image estrogen receptor, and particularly estrogen receptor function, we might have a better predictive value. Because you really want to know whether the receptor is functional. One of the functions is binding hormone. That could be assessed in vivo by PET, but was initially assessed on tumor biopsy samples by biochemical assays, and now in a way has sort of regressed to look for just some sort of protein antigen. Now, we worked to get ways of labeling steroids with isotopes that can be used for positron emission tomography. Fluorine 18 is a very convenient one, has good nuclear characteristics, has a two-hour half-life, and this compound called FES has a fluorine at the 16 alpha position. I'll come back to this other one in just a minute. Now, in a, in a sort of a qualifying, well, this is how it's made. Obviously, the synthesis has to be uh, rapid because of the short half-life. This was our initial synthesis where we displaced the triflate and did a reduction to get uh, FES. There's another synthesis that was developed about a dozen years later uh, that's actually somewhat more convenient. Now, just to test whether this compound actually was selectively taken up by target organs, if one uses an immature rat, which has low endogenous estrogen levels, FES is taken up very avidly by the by the uteris, uterus and ovaries, but not by um, non-target tissues. And it's blocked very specifically by an excess of unlabeled estradiol in these tissues, whereas the non-target tissues are not blocked. Now, the liver and kidney have high levels because most of the dose is fluxing through those uh, organs as part of roots of excretion. So it shows the characteristics of selective uptake in the target and selective displacement from the target. But the question is, will it really realistically image ER positive breast tumors by PET. And PET, if you don't uh, know what it stands for, it stands for positron emission tomography. Certain isotopes that have excesses of, of protons will decay by a proton converting to a neutron, which ejects an antimatter particle equivalent to a positive electron. It annihilates with a normal electron, generating two energy photons that come out precisely in opposite directions at the same time. 
And if you have a device, a positron emission tomograph, which is a series of detectors surrounding a patient, you can look for coincident events on uh, detectors opposite sides of this circle, and you can reconstruct an image in three dimensions. And this was an image we obtained some years ago with fluoroestradiol. And you can see a primary tumor. This is a, a transverse image, basically uh, what would be a hypothetical slice uh, perpendicular to the axis of the body. Primary tumor, chest wall metastasis, and the liver, because again, a lot is fluxing through the liver. Now, we heard uh, yesterday a very nice uh, talk um, by Dan Heller about uh, how you can image things, and imaging tumors is really no great fate. I've sometimes said if you label dirt, you could actually image a tumor because it picks up particulates and lots of things. So is this a meaningful accumulation that is uh, dictated by the presence of receptor? So we did find that if we took out tumors uh, and measured estrogen receptor concentrations, that the intensity of the image did correlate with receptor concentration. But the real question is, does it predict better the response to endocrine therapies? And here I return to the slide I showed at the start. So this is the target that we have, the receptor, and we have fluoroestradiol to image this. But twice as many patients have receptor than respond. And so the question is, was there some way we could also image response? And so this is what's typically done now if a woman has an abnormal mammogram and the biopsy is obtained, receptor levels are measured by immunohistochemistry. If they're receptor positive, they're often put on the drug that uh, would block receptor action in some way. And the clinical outcome is assessed by radiological methods or standard uh, clinical criteria. This can take several months to establish whether the therapy is effective. And if it isn't, one's lost time uh, and, and proceeds then probably with somewhat uh, less good outcome. Now, what we're proposing to do is to query the receptor in the tumor itself with fluoroestradiol and also to look at a cellular response, the uptake of fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a general tumor imaging agent and measures glucose demand. And most tumors have hyperglycolytic activity, so this is a general tumor marker. Now you might expect if the therapy is effective that this would go down with therapy, but we were looking for something else, which I'll mention at, uh, in a minute. So what was done is that advanced breast cancer patients were first imaged for receptor and cellular response or metabolism before any therapy. They were started on tamoxifen, which is a, an antiestrogen that still has a little bit of partial agonist activity. Uh, they were imaged then after a week or 10 days for receptor, and we would expect tamoxifen would block receptor, also for glucose. They were continued and assessed for clinical outcome by standard therapies, standard assessments. Here we looked for a decrease to indicate, like the, in the parallel with the rat uterus, that we could block the uptake if it was due to receptor. Here we were actually looking uh, in responders for an increase because it's known clinically that some patients who are feeling pain will feel worse for about a week on tamoxifen and then feel better. And this has to do with a transient stimulation of the tumor as tamoxifen levels are building up because it's somewhat of a partial agonist, particularly at low concentration. So we were looking for a metabolic correlate of clinical flare. Clinical flare is not very useful because if you don't have symptoms, you don't sense it or the disease may progress, so you may feel worse, but never be responded. So here are some images before tamoxifen. This is a receptor image. This is a glucose image. This is standardized uptake value, which is sort of a ratio with what would be uniform distribution. So this would be five times greater than that. After tamoxifen, the receptor image is blocked, as we had hoped. And in this patient, we saw actually an increase in the intensity of the glucose uptake, which we would classify as a metabolic flare. Another patient, a really clear indication of three tumors with uh, the receptor agent, a rather equivocal image based on metabolism, a complete blockade, 90% blockade uh, after tamoxifen, and here an increase. Now, 40 patients went through this, were classified as responders and non-responders by oncologists who were blinded to the results of imaging. And this is how the responders and non-responders uh, turned out in terms of the fluoroestradiol uptake. And if we say a SUV of two is a cutoff, We've now improved from no predictive value, these are all ER positive patients, uh, a positive predictive value of nearly 80% and a negative predictive value of nearly 90%. So the in vivo assessment of the capacity of the tumor to take up an estrogen binding activity is better than the immunohistochemistry assay. Now what was particularly striking is that the difference between the initial and the final glucose measurement a week later showed that if you had a 10% or greater increase, 
you had really a 90% chance of being a responder, whereas if you were below that, you had a 95, 94% chance of being a non-responder. So we've really greatly improved the predictive value uh, using PET by looking at the presence of the target, whether the estrogen receptor is capable of binding ligand, but also particularly querying whether the receptor is, poss is able to mediate this transient stimulation seen with tamoxifen. And really, this is a, a hormone challenge paradigm that measures function that I think can really be generalized uh, and really increase the power of um, prognostic and predictive um, biomarker imaging. Now, we've done an additional study. So that took a week, two images and a week, to tell whether a patient would respond. We did another study in more heavily pretreated patients who are now going on other endocrine therapies that would not cause a flare, more complete antiestrogens or aromatase inhibitors. And we did a different sort of challenge. So we imaged glucose and estrogen uh, receptor levels as before. These patients were then given one dose of estradiol for one day and imaged again for glucose. And here you can see an enormous increase in glucose uptake just after one day in what's a responder. Now we didn't re-image the receptor because it turned out that the second image after uh, an endocrine challenge was completely blocked and didn't add value. And it turned out in this study with the heavily pretreated patients, they were all considered ER positive based either on history or more recent assays by immunohistochemistry uh, methods. Uh, only a third was expected to respond and we got a third responders. Now here the receptor image uh, uh, intensity using the old cutoffs was less predictive than before. Not surprising, these were more heavily pretreated patients. But the functional endocrine challenge, now just one day of estradiol, really separated the responders from the non responders very effectively. And so, again, this is a, a measurement of the function of the receptor. Even in these advanced patients, we could tell in one day whether the system was functional and was likely to respond to these more advanced endocrine therapies. And so the change in glucose uptake is predictive even in these heavily pretreated patients. It's much more predictive than the uh, ER immunohistochemistry assay, as well as assays of other uh, targets. Uh, now, I think the conclusion to make is that the test of function, if it's possible, will be more informative than the test of presence. If you have targeted therapy, you always need the target, but the target has to be functional. And if you look at uh, a lot of assays, uh, a lot of methods like uh, Herceptin for HER2, the target has to be there. But even if the target is there, you get a 30% response rate. So if you can develop uh, sort of challenges to see whether the target is, is functional, that can be more informative. Now, going forward, the last set of data I've plotted here as accumulation of non-responders and responders as a function of change in glucose. And they're really pretty well separated. That's why we got those high predictive values. But if you look at the respondents and non-responders and imagine that you might have a 10% error in your measurement, that includes about 25% of the cases. And really, you'd like to have a test that would separate the respondents and non-responders really quite dramatically. So we're looking at other things that we could image that might be uh, more robust predictors of the function, functional status of the estrogen receptor. And one target is the progesterone receptor, which is very acutely regulated by estrogen stimulation. This is a xenograft system, MCF7 cells, uh, grown in a thymic mice. And you can see when they're withdrawn from estrogen and then re-stimulated, the levels of PR, RNA, and protein go up very dramatically, as do other uh, proteins. But PR is something that we can image. And I showed you this molecule, somewhat more decorated progestin, that, that can be used to actually image progesterone receptor positive tumors in humans. Now, this is a, an early study that was just published where we can see that we can identify PR positive patients, but the real study would be comparing uh, before and after an estrogen challenge to see if we get a more robust response that's uh, even more predictive of the success of endocrine therapies. So a test of function, as I said, will be more informative than test of presence if you can do it. And really, I urge all of you who are going into the cancer area, particularly the cancer uh, detection or imaging area, to focus on the medically relevant question. Because there's a lot of imaging you can do that's sort of neat and neat technology. But if you want to have an impact on medicine, you really have to understand what the medical questions are and what the current limits uh, on diagnostic methodologies are.
So I've had a lot of people over the years who've worked on this. These are past uh, coworkers, current people in my lab doing various aspects of PET imaging. I mentioned at the start that uh, colleagues at Washington University Medical School, Mike Welch and many of his colleagues have been uh, integral in these studies and these are the funding agencies. So thank you very much again for the chance to talk. It's like a natural step to go from uh, these molecules as imaging probes to therapeutics. So, for example, linking to a yttria molecule. Or right. So, um, <clears throat> because the target is intracellular, you have to be a little careful not to perturb the structure so much that you change the distribution properties. We're looking actually at other halogens. So uh, bromine 77 has uh, very effective uh, OJ cascades. And because this is localized on the chromatin, sometimes you can get very uh, uh, effective local damage by the OJ cascade, uh, the high linear energy transfer of those uh, low energy electrons. So that's something that, that we're working on. There are other people that are using iodine-123, which is a similar uh, isotope. But maintaining um, the very favorable target to non-target distribution and a retention of the target tissue consistent with the half-life of the isotope is also important. So we have to optimize other characteristics. And for one more question. I was wondering if this was as predictive for some, a woman with stage four breast cancer as with someone with PCIS? Um, at this point, we've not used it with DCIS, which would actually be really great if we could do that. I think that the actual mass of tumor tissue in DCIS is relatively small, though the levels of receptor could be high. We talked about how to do this, um, but at this point we haven't done it. Uh, but it's really been the later stage cancers where we've gotten good predictive values. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.